Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for gathering us together today again as your people, and giving us time to study your word, and specifically how your word has come to us. Send us your Holy Spirit as we are working to, to use our wisdom and understanding that uh, through our time together, that we might grow in our faith and our knowledge that you would be glorified in us. So we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. First thing first, we've got to check on our uh, reading plan that's inwardly digest that we've been working our way through. Um, this last week was Ezra and Nehemiah, almost all of Nehemiah. Um, any questions or thoughts that you were reading through from last week? Oh, oh, oh. I mentioned uh, um, in the recording that I made for, uh, if you're following along with that podcast thing, um, that Ezra and Nehemiah kind of fills in a gap, at least it did fill in that gap that I had. Um, I could, for a while, tell you most of the stories from, you know, Genesis, all the the patriarchs there, Exodus, I might know the judge or two, some of the names, but from there, the whole kind of Bible timeline fell apart in my mind. So this helps fill in the gap. This is after they've been picked out of the land of Israel. They're brought back into the land and they return and they rebuild. And this is essentially where the, the plot line of the Old Testament leaves off. Uh, before Jesus comes, uh, about 400, 500 years after this. Um, so this is, it, it helps me to, to put that in perspective and get that timeline. So it was kind of interesting because they're early, but the the last prophet before Micah, he said, no, no. and Nehemiah is not a prophet. Yes, Ezra and Nehemiah are not prophets. Okay. So Ezra is a scribe, he's an expert in the law, and Nehemiah was the cupbearer of the king. So neither one is exactly a prophet, but God is using both of these people, uh, Ezra to rebuild the temple, Nehemiah the walls, and the two of them together, along with a couple of prophets, um, they are working to reestablish the religious nature of this people. Why not work on electrically place the books? It's a good question. Um, and in different traditions, they are placed differently. Um, in some ways, it relatively is chronologically. Daniel Kings and Chronicles kind of goes back and does some things, but Ezra and Nehemiah okay. are the end. But then the prophets. The prophets are all prophesying during the time of the king. So you'd have to break up Samuel and Kings to insert those prophets in their proper time of places. Uh, and so it, it would kind of, it wouldn't necessarily hurt those books, but make it a little more difficult to read and know what book you're reading and when. And, um, there's always that question with some of the prophets too, what exactly their circumstances are. Some of them we know pretty pretty clearly. Others, it's just, here's what happened. Okay, <laughs> now what do we do with that? Um, or I'm even thinking of um, in the book of Psalms. We know a lot, right? David wrote the Psalms in some of it, right? After Nathan confronted him after all of that, she was wrong. We've got a psalm for that situation. Um, but then there's others that are just a psalm. So where do we end up putting that? Um, there's a psalm in there written by Moses. So do we put that in the first five books? Or so a script chronological Bible is a lot more difficult to, to arrange. Um, there are some reading plans that go through more chronologically. Uh, in one of these years, it might be a, a fun exercise to do that. Uh, but by and large, it, the Old Testament, as we read it today, today is roughly chronological. It's probably the best way I can say that. <laughs> All right. As always, if there's questions that come up or thoughts, uh, let me know. I love answering questions and thinking theologically with you all, so um, keep up the good work. And if you get behind, don't worry. Just forget what you haven't read and start where we're at. Uh, and you can fix other stuff later. Uh, do whatever you need to. Um, it's always good to be together in that word. So... That brings us back to our uh, Bible study series, How We Got the Bible. Um, last week we kind of had half a Bible study as we were celebrating confirmation. There was a little bit of a reception going on there as well. Um, but on some of your tables there, you've got the handout that we had from last week dealing with the issue of Hammond. 
This is the question of what books end up in the New Testament and Old Testament, for that matter, in the Bibles as we have it. Um, contrary to popular belief, there is never a top-down declaration that this is your Bible, deal with it. That's, uh, we looked last week, we heard the Da Vinci Code, that's one of the claims made in the book, that Constantine decided what books were going to be in the Bible, which books weren't. He ordered everyone to have this Bible, and anything that wasn't Bible, you were going to have to burn it all up and destroy it, and all you're left with is the book, the Bible. Uh, rewrite stuff along the way, that's just what it is. Um, problem is, that is, first of all, not historically accurate. And second of all, it's not even logical or feasible for something like that to happen. Um, if we're thinking the ancient world here, uh, Constantine is, is ruling in Rome, uh, and Christianity by this point has spread all throughout, uh, not just the Roman Empire, but it's, it's spread out from there. Thomas is rumored um, to has went as far as India to share Jesus with that. And all of these different groups have different books of, of the scriptures, different uh, books they consider authoritative. Um, and so, what do we do with that? How, how in the world is Constantine going to travel to every single church in India and destroy the, you know, not as uh, spiritual Jesus in those, or not as divine Jesus books that they might have, instead of saying, uh, well, this is what it is. Quite well, frankly, it, it's not logical, that popular understanding. More realistically, how we got the canon, the, this book, the Bible that we have, is the church said, this is the book that we have. And this is not the church as in one leader in the church says, this is what we have. But we took a look at individual congregations. What books are you using? What books do you read in worship? Which books do you encourage your members to read at home outside of worship? And as church leaders get together and as they're comparing, they're recognizing, hey, uh, we have a lot of the same books here. We've got some questions about a few of them, but by and large, the early church is relatively unanimous as to which books are in and which books are out. Uh, last week we took a look at the first two categories that were on your handout, which is the homologumina and antilogumina. Uh, homologumina are the ones that no one's really ever questioned. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Paul's letters, 1 Peter, 1 John, everyone just kind of assumed, yes, these are in. Everyone's using them, everyone recognizes who wrote them, why they wrote them, what they need, they're good. <laughs> From there, there were a few books that were spoken against. That's what antilogomena means. Hebrews, James, 2 Peter, 3 John, Jude, and Revelation. And these, let's see, three, five, seven books or so, people had a question about. Uh, there's an open question on who wrote the book of Hebrews, even today. Uh, there's some in the early church that were pretty convinced it was Paul. Some say Paul wrote it in Hebrew and Luke translates it into Greek, so it's kind of Luke and Paul. Um, but there's some authorship question here. There's some content question. Jude quotes the book of Enoch, which is not in anyone's Bible. The book of Revelation as a whole is just kind of strange. Um, even just this last week, I, I read another article that uh, just came out that Revelation very early was accepted. Because everyone knew it was written by John the Apostle. But as time goes on, as people are reading it, they say, hey, this is really weird. Why would we put this in, in this book, this collection of Bibles? Why would we consider this in it? Uh, and so it kind of falls out of favor. But then uh, as time goes on, people start going back to it and say, well, this was written by John. And yeah, it's weird, but let's try to understand this weirdness and not just write it off completely. And as they start getting into it, they realize, hey, there's a lot of good stuff here, and it's actually thoroughly orthodox. Yes, it's hard to understand, but it was written by John, it is faithful and true, and it uh, kind of comes back into popularity as time goes on here. Uh, so that was roughly what we covered last week with you know, starting our discussion of canon here, what's in and what's out. Uh, are there any questions or thoughts left over from last week as we started working on this stuff? Yes, sir. Is it 
interesting to think that some of these original manuscripts might have been in the library of Alexandria. So the question is, is it reasonable to think any of these manuscripts are at the library of Alexandria? And uh, I don't know. Uh, first of all, because I'm not up to date on my uh, ancient Egyptian history, and, and I guess it's not as far ancient as I'm thinking even is. Uh, that Roman Egyptian time period. Uh, but I, I don't know. Um, I know this is one of the things that they are, they're really discussing. Um, one of the, the towns that it was destroyed by Mount Vesuvius when it erupted, it destroyed Pompeii and another city is the Herculaneum. Um, and uh, they, they discovered the ancient library there, Herculaneum. Everything is just completely turned to carbon. It's just completely destroyed. Except they're now discovering technologies that allow them to, without unrolling a scroll, to peer inside, even in a chart, to try to understand what's inside. And there are some people that speculate there might be a copy of one of these early books in there. Um, at this point, it's speculation. We just don't know. Uh, we don't have any evidence one way or the other. Um, it, it's always a possibility that we will be surprised by something we don't know. And uh, it seems to happen more often than we would uh, like to think. We would like to think we know everything, but uh, we don't. All right. So as we are working our way through this canon, uh, this issue of, of um, what's in, what's out, what's authoritative, what is not, there are other writings out there circulating at the time of the early church, the first few hundred years. Um, and the question is, how do we understand them? How do we categorize them? And so there are really two words that are used to, to somewhat cover the same set of documents here. Uh, you've got deuterocanon and apocrypha. Now, part of the, the challenge here is that over the course of history, even within one writer, one author, how they use these words change. So, I, again, we're, we're going to run into some issues here, but in general, this, this word deuterocanon, deutero is second and canon, again, rule. Um, this is a secondary canon, um, uh, something that, that is in addition to our traditional 66 book New Testament, Old Testament that we know today. Um, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, it's used in parallel, or it's another way to say the, the word apocrypha. Um, especially as we know, like, the apocrypha, you know, the set of extra books that it's making in the New Testament, um, it's there. Now, deuterocanon in uh, at least the Roman Catholic understanding is, is that these books are not a secondary canon as in they're less than the 66 books that we know, but they are just less in time. They are more recent. So they're a second canon and second to be accepted, but they're all fully accepted. Um, so the books we know that are, or we consider that are in the, uh, the Apocrypha here are uh, not quite the ones, uh, or at least um, they are in other traditions, they are accepted fully as scripture just as the rest of those 66 books are. We've got some discrepancies there, but as we're going to see here, the lines around canon are much fuzzier than we would like. How we got the 66, even coming to that number of 66, is, is kind of a mess. Part of the, the trouble here is that we're apocryphal is used in at least two different ways in the ancient world. Um, I've got it listed here. Um, writings that are good for personal use, but not canon. That people knew of, they read, they understood, but they, generally speaking, didn't consider them to be scripture. To be what was written by God through men. 
Caleb is there are other writings that some of the early church fathers call apocrypha that are just, they're bad. They're out there. Um, they, they are more harmful than anything else. Um, maybe not actually written by the, the right person, so that gets into the category of pseudepigrapha. Which is another one of these fun words here that you've got in our uh, our attempt to understand here. Um, writings that are said to be written by one person but aren't actually. So there are a few books of the Bible, um, not books of the Bible, books that are floating around there, um, or especially around the time of Jesus, that um, I, I mentioned already, the Book of Enoch. Floating around within the 100, 200 years of Jesus, uh, probably before Jesus, roughly that time. Um, but do you remember where Enoch is in the Bible? He's got half a verse in one of the geneal- genealogical lists in Genesis. Enoch walked with God and he was not. That's okay. That's what we get of Enoch in the Old Testament. But, now, what? Four or five thousand years after that, someone comes along and writes a book in his name. This is what Enoch says. Well, what do we make of that? Well, the early Christian community took a look at that and said, ha, nice try. <laughs> Some of them read it just to say, hey, let's, let's make sure we're up to snuff on all of this. And they read it and it's not great stuff. Um, <clears throat> So pretty clearly, there's this distinction sometimes that's being made in how this this word apocrypha is used. So we've got to be careful, especially as we'll move forward in, in, well, either today or next week about looking at those first-hand sources. How are they using these words and how are they understanding what we know as canon? So I've listed a few... um, a few extra books that are considered this apocrypha. I've roughly split it up into different groups. What um, what books they consider part of the Deuterocanon, part of the canon, but maybe not uh, completely. So there's uh, most of the Roman Catholic has these extra books in the Old Testament: Tobit, uh, Judith, the Wisdom of, of Solomon, Sirach. Uh, that one has a whole bunch of different names because it's technically I think Jesus, son of Sirach. Um, but it's also known as Ecclesiasticus, so it's, that's messy. Um, Baruch, who is, uh, is Jeremiah's uh, scribe, if I remember right, or his servant. Um, so the letter of Jeremiah is in there as well. First and Second Maccabees are historical books. Um, depending on uh, where you look, Greek Esther might be old Greek Esther, or might be just listed as additions to Esther. So it's Esther with extra material here and there things to be inserted in the book that gives a little more detail. Same with the additions to Daniel, and there's a whole bunch of those. Uh, Susanna, Bella, and Dragon, the Prayer of Azariah, and again, lots of different names for that last one, but the Song of Three Holy Children is one of the titles that that one goes by. Yes, sir? Uh, where did you uh, get the uh, list for the um, Catholic Testament, the Archival books? I believe I got that from the Catholic Because some of those books, I assume you're, you're looking at maybe the letter of Jeremiah or um, things like that. Some of those are included in uh, their perspective, perspective books. So this letter of Jeremiah is not in the Roman Catholic Bible several from Jeremiah, but it's included in Jeremiah. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. If I see the double here, that would be part of the edition. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So. Um, so, um, there are a whole bunch of those. Uh, depending on which church body you're looking at today, there are others. There's a whole group of Orthodox uh, church bodies uh, that even broke away from. Uh, well, hard to describe. They're a second branch of Christianity from very early on. They have extra books, the first and second Ezra's, um, which, again, names, terminologies, what books are being referred to is is really difficult. Sometimes in ancient sources, first and second Ezra's are Ezra and Nehemiah. 
Other times, it's not Ezra and Nehemiah, but kind of additions to Ezra and Nehemiah that Ezra wrote that sometimes they'll call third and fourth Ezra instead of first and second Ezra's. This is very confusing, and I had a hard time trying to sort this all out. Uh, Prayer of Manasseh is one. Third and fourth Maccabees. So first and second Maccabees are some historical books, and then, oh, we need more history, so we'll add another couple books there. Um, Another one that's uh, especially in Orthodox churches that they hold to is Psalm 151, an extra psalm in the book of Psalms. Uh, it's, uh, if I'm remembering right, it's a psalm that commemorates David's battle against Goliath, if I'm remembering the contents of that one. So it's just extra stuff going on there. Um, those are mostly the, uh, uh, what we call them the apocryphal books. Um, from the Old Testament. There's a whole bunch at around the time of the New Testament as well that we, we know are out there. Is that the Eastern Orthodox Church? Then? Is I have uh, the Greek Orthodox or Eastern Orthodox Church? I, I kind of lumped them all together there because okay. there is so much variety um, and different branches within Orthodoxy. You know, I, I know the Greek Orthodox is different than the Syrian Orthodox is different than the Coptic Orthodox. And, and, and so I just, for our purposes just won't come all together. Okay. Yeah. 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 It, as much as we talk about the Orthodox Church, this is one big branch of the family tree that's got lots of little little branches along the way there. Split in as many denominations as we have. So, um, so they're not uh, they're not free from any other issues. All right. So, um, New Testament Apocrypha. So these are books that were floating around around the time other <clears throat> books of the New Testament are written. And then there are some church fathers who said, hey, these should be in, in the Bible. These should be canon. These should be considered authoritative. So the Shepherd of Hermas is one that was very, very popular very early on. Um, the Didache, we, we've mentioned that book a few times. It's a description of Christian worship. Um, there's references in some of our early sources to the gospel according to the Hebrews. Um, a couple letters that Clement wrote, first and second Clement, Clement uh, the epistle of Barnabas, that Barnabas is said to have written, uh, the epistle to the Laodiceans. This is one that, that uh, is referenced, I think, in the book of Colossians. That Paul says, all right, uh, when you're done reading this letter, send it to the Laodiceans, uh, have them read your letter. And why don't you take the letter I wrote to them and you read it too? So we know that there's another letter of Paul out there. And there's one that we know of that's the epistle to the Laodiceans. But there's a question, is it actually by Paul or not? This is one that's, uh, um, it would be right for forging if there were ever a thing. We know a title. We know he wrote to these people. What did he write? Um, and so it, it's possible uh, that should be in, but it's possible it should be out as well. And there's very early questions on all of these, and then some. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list of these other books. Uh, but there's some question on these, but by and large, um, the church as a whole, as they're having these conversations, says, you know, these are good, but not everyone's using them. We're not sure about the content. We're not sure about the authorship. So read them if you want. It's okay. But it's not canon. It's not part of this collection that we are seeing as authoritative and worthy of using as a theological standard for our understanding. Pastor, the Lutheran study Bible on page 1562. For several pages, it gives... Luther's preferences to the apocryphal. Yeah. yeah. It's good for you to find out what Luther's going on. Yeah, and it's interesting. We'll talk about Luther as we keep going on here. Luther has some interesting additions to our conversation here. Uh, again, that introduction is really helpful. Even on, on the title page, as he translates his Bible into German, he translates the apocrypha as we know it. Um, but he, he puts it big bold block letters at the front page of the Apocrypha good to read or useful to read but not can like he makes it very clear what's really interesting it's still bound together with the rest of the New Testament and Old Testament so there's as much as we see the church making distinctions about what's in, what's out, what's can and what's not, what's authoritative, what's not what's scripture, what's not 
they're so binding things together. They're so including these books in their, their manuscripts. Um, what is it? The um, Codex Sinaiticus, sort of Codex Vaticanus. These two ones that have the whole Bible. Some of them have extra books. One of them has Shepherd of Hermes. Um, uh, another one has uh, the Epistle of, uh, of Barnabas in there. Um, it's bound together in there. But is it canon? Is it part of Scripture or not? And on the one hand, we've got manuscripts. And we've got to try to figure out what's going on with manuscripts. And what are they preserving? What is worth then reading? Uh, but on the other hand, and we'll take a look at this as time goes on here, um, we also have lists that they wrote to say, all right, in spite of what we're binding together and reading, because we like to read, we like to study, we like to learn, in spite of the manuscripts that we have, here's what we consider authority. Um, we call them canon lists. It's a list that early church fathers, and that we've got a whole, a whole bunch of them from the ancient world to say, these books are in, these books are in. Uh, and so it's, it's really a balancing act of trying to deal the best we can with the evidence that we have. And again, it's not as clear-cut as we said that I would like. I'm sure all of us would like things a little more clear-cut too. This is the Bible descending out of heaven from God, but that would then be the Quran. Allah reveals these words to Muhammad. Muhammad recites them. People memorize them and write them down and then you've got the Quran. Or the Book of Mormon. That, all right. Golden tablets fall out of the sky. Joseph Smith uncovers them, translates them, and you've got the Book of Mormon. We don't have that in the Christian church. We don't. We don't have a book descending out of heaven from God. This is your Bible. What we do have is God inspiring people to write down his words and preserve them from one generation to the next. This is all part of how God works. And part of how he works is by leaving things a little nebulous. By forcing us to trust that he's given us what we need. Now, whether you draw the line in in this, you know, big mess of a canon before the Apocrypha or after the Apocrypha, I, I've got an opinion on that. But the more I'm studying here, the more I'm realizing it's a lot messier than I want it to be. And so I've got to have a little bit more grace for people that come down to different places as they're trying to, to understand what God has given us. Well, that leads me to say, in terms of the Apocrypha, I have not personally read any of it. Mm-hmm. Are there things in the Apocrypha that are clearly correct according to our understanding of the canon? The or Lord is the that canon. more uh, is it more consistent with orthodox theology, but not, it's more of a question of the authorship, it's more a question of uh, uh, authenticity. Uh, so the only thing that comes to my mind, and I have not read through the whole book, <coughs> uh, but I know there's reference, I believe it's in one of the magazines, of praying to the dead. Um, that uh, might be a kind of a prayer to the saints thing that the Catholic Church develops later on in their history. Um, but apart from that, I'm not aware of anything that's like very much, you know, not um, not consistent with the theology of the rest of Scripture. Which is why most of it, you know, is considered. Yeah, go ahead and read it. It's fine to read. It's fine to learn and understand. But it does not hold the same weight, the same authority as the Bible, as the, the rest of the books we consider canonical, authoritative. It mentions a dragon. Yeah, it mentions the dragon, which is is a weird thing, and yet at the same time, uh, we very much think of dragons as mythological creatures. Uh, but we also know dinosaurs existed. Could it be that one of the ways they described a dinosaur was as a dragon? Um, and again, there's lots of speculation on all of this. Um, but uh, I'm one more likely to believe that there, there, there are more creatures than we have discovered in our you know, archaeological findings. Joe, uh, kind of-
kind of mentioned some things itself. I need to The Leviathan, the, uh, what was the other one that's in there? Uh, yeah, some weird kind of, whether it's a dragon, dinosaur, yeah. or a couple of scales on the big feet. And I think it was fire. I can't remember that right offhand, but yeah, yeah, there's, there's some strange, um, mythological, or at least mythological sounding creatures in, in scripture. Even apart from Bell and the Dragon. I think it's in Maccabees that the Roman Catholics grabbed onto the concept of purgatory. Okay, could it be? Yeah, and again, all of this is very interesting because it didn't happen that they were reading all of Scripture and said, all right, here's what we believe is going on here. Uh, most of these theologies developed either out of popular practice or of uh, practical necessity or uh, even a logical sort of system that they had set in place. And only then did they go to the text and say, where is this found? Where can we find some justification for it? Uh, we'll see in a moment, uh, again, probably not this week, but next week, we'll look at, at some of the canons from the Council of Trent as they say, all right, here's our canon. This is the Bible for the Roman Catholic Church. Before that, there was no official thing from the Catholic Church to say that this is our Bible. The Council of Trent is a response to the Reformation. And so before then, there's, it seems many in the church, not just around that those spheres, were, were okay saying, you know, this is roughly where we are and that's okay. A Council of Trent happens and very much there's now this dividing line. Catholics say it's in, Protestants say it's out. End of story. What's interesting is this is one of the earlier canons in the Council of Trent. So, they declare it to be scripture, and now based on this authoritative scripture, let's make some theology. Now, again, this is very much a crude way of describing it, and a very Lutheran way of describing it, not the, necessarily how Catholics would describe it. Uh, and yet, uh, they declare that to be the Bible, and now based on that, Let's make some decisions here. Um, and, and we see that kind of as backwards. Uh, instead of saying, all right, we've decided within and out, uh, we see the unanimous testimony of the church throughout history has been Christ crucified and risen. We've got our basic theology in those 66 books. Um, and even, God forbid, should we lose any of the books of the Bible, our theology is not going to be altered all that. Because our theology is not meant to be proof texted of, or the only reason we have our theology is because that one Bible verse and that one book that may or may not even be in the Bible. Uh, but it's a much broader foundation that it's built off of. I see that in your doing your demonstration there of the, of the two different books. I was saying, you know, what, what did we get from heaven? That was Jesus. And, uh, you know, you said uh, you know, Smith got the yeah, yeah. Got the golden thing, and uh, you know Muhammad got this book, and we got, we got Jesus. Yeah, exactly. We got his word. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, um, that's one of the things that uh, the more you get into say Islam, uh, it's not the Quran versus the Bible. Those are two different things. It's the Quran versus Jesus. Right. Some sort of direct uh, manifestation of God in this world. And, in Islam, that's the Quran. Muhammad's just a prophet. He's pointing to that book. He's received this book, but it's not in his own making. It's all completely one-sided from God. He's really just, there is one who receives. That's really our place in Christianity. The folks who receive Jesus, who hear his word and then go proclaim Jesus to the world. And as we go about that proclaiming, especially as the early Apostles did that proclaiming. That's what we have as the Bible. Um, it's, a, it's a testimony to the truth of Jesus uh, as opposed to something, something else. Yeah. The Word made flesh. Exactly. Yep. The Word of God spoken throughout the Old Testament takes on human form, becomes man, and down from heaven is current by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary. That sort of thing. This is Jesus. Absolutely. Okay. So apart from the Apocrypha, there are a whole bunch of other books out there. Um, uh, 
this next category I have on here is the pseudo-Hebrew brother falsely attributed to other people, usually prophets, apostles, or other famous biblical characters. And almost always, as the early church is talking about books, what's out there, they know of all these, and they quickly reject all of these. So you have uh, this from the Old Testament, extra books that don't enter in, the book of Enoch, the Assumption of Moses, the Ascension of Isaiah, the Sibylline Oracles, the Testament of Adam, the Book of Jubilees, the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs, the Book of Noah, the Magical Books of Moses, and the list could go on and on and on there. Um, during the time, especially the, the 100, 200 years before Jesus, there are other writings being uh, put to paper. Um, but the church sees those and says, all right, we don't have all of a sudden something new from from Moses or Adam or Noah that we didn't know about already. This extra stuff is very clearly written at a later date, later time, different purpose than one of the original authors. So um, the Christian community, and, and quite frankly, most of the Jewish community recognizes not scripture. Most of it is, you probably shouldn't even read, it's, it's just junk sort of stuff. Um, the best way I've heard this described, the, the most, um, the kindest way I've heard this, this described is at, as if you're writing Bible fan fiction. Uh, you're taking characters from the Bible and you're writing your own stories using those characters, but it's not really what those characters have done or said or did, but you're just using them for your own purposes to further your own agenda. And uh, very clearly there's a whole bunch of that going on around the time a hundred years before and after Jesus. The, there's a whole bunch of other supposed Gospels out there. The Gospel of the Egyptians, the, the Twelve Apostles, the Gospel of Vaseline, whoever that guy is, the Gospel of Thomas, of Matthew, of Mary, of Peter. Uh, again, the list goes on and on. It's not as if, though, you've got the four Gospels as well as all these other hundred Gospels, and the church says, oh, no, what do we do? We don't know who Jesus is. That's not what's going on. The church, centered around the apostles, has listened to what the apostles have preached, what they believe, what they've confessed. And when they take a look at these, all of these writings out there, they say, all right, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we know these people. We've heard from them. We believe that this is the testimony about Jesus. And, and as for all these other ones, uh, either it wasn't written by the person that we're, they're saying were written, because we know that person, or we know people who've learned from that person, it, there's just no way that's them. Or they, they read it and say, well, the gospel according to the Egyptians? <laughs> Come on here. We're, we know who Jesus is, and if it describes Jesus in a, in a way that is contrary to what we know, we're just going to get rid of it. Uh, one of these, uh, the Gospel of Thomas, is a very well-known, it's called a Gnostic Gospel. It's a whole set of writings that is um, based off of a very early branch of Christianity that very quickly becomes heretical. The God of the Old Testament is not the same God of the New Testament. The God of the Old Testament made the physical world. Everything physical we know is evil. Everything physical is bad. So really, we need to escape the physical world. Jesus comes to set us free from the physical, and he is just a spiritual being. He didn't actually become human, by the way. He just looked like it. Because we know that the physical world is evil, it's bad, it's wrong. And so we need someone from the spiritual world to make us more spiritual. And, and so Gospel of Thomas is, is wacko out there with a lot of stuff. Um, I believe it's the Gospel of Thomas uh, that Jesus tells him at one point, um, I think he may be talking to Mary Magdalene and said, all right, uh, you can't be saved because you're a woman. But don't worry, I'll make you a man so you can be saved. <laughs> uh, I don't think so on that one. Uh, as much as our modern world like, like to cling to some of those uh, weird stuff going on, um, we recognize this is nonsense. And the church has known it is nonsense from the day it's been written. So, yeah, this is, again, maybe 15, 20 years ago, they were discovering and propagating all these books in modern scholarly circles. And see, the church, the church has been hiding this history from you. Well, no. The church has known about this stuff. The church has written about this stuff. The church has rejected this stuff from the beginning. Not because it's threatened their power. 
But because it's just bunk, the church has known it from the beginning. Um, along with those Gospels, there are extra um, Acts. So the Acts of Andrew, the Acts of John, the Acts of Paul and Thecla. I had a great, great grandmother named Thecla, uh, named after this character. I don't know much about it. Um, Acts of Peter, or Philip, or Thomas, of Xanthibi, Polixena, and Rebecca. Uh, that was a new one to me as I was researching. Uh, uh, Xanthippi is always a fun name. Um, and, and there's all sorts of other uh, acts of different people. The book of Acts is interesting uh, because... All right, what do you include what don't you include? There's all sorts of mission work going on. Uh, so what part gets put in, what part gets out? And where do we draw the line of, all right, we're only going to write Acts until this point, and after this point, it's no longer Scripture, but the early records of history are Scripture. And so you can understand why, all right, we want to know more about what Peter did. So let's follow him and follow the Acts of Peter as he goes out and shares the Gospel. The problem with a lot of these Acts is that they are later. They're not written around the same time as the rest of the New Testament. And so as much as some people are reading them and curious about them and, and hold to them, uh, by and large people recognize it's not actually Thomas writing about his acts, uh, but it's someone much later in time trying to claim Thomas as his own for his own purposes to get his own theology out there. Uh, same with epistles. There are a whole bunch of other epistles out there. There's the epistle of Peter to Philip. Uh, the epistle of Paul and Seneca, apparently the two wrote letters to each other. Um, there's the book of 3 Corinthians floating around out there, which is always interesting. Um, we know in, in 1 Corinthians, Paul makes a reference to a letter he wrote previously. So what we know as 1 Corinthians is really 2 Corinthians. And the book of 2 Corinthians, as we know, it refers back to a different letter. It doesn't sound like 1 Corinthians that it might be 3rd Corinthians, and so what we have is 1st and 2nd Corinthians, should really be 3rd, 2nd, and 4th Corinthians. Um, and there's a missing 1st and 3rd Corinthians, so maybe this is one of them. Uh, again, the early church knew about this letter floating around out there, and said, this is not Paul. This is not worth reading or holding on to. Um, we're just going to get rid of it. Uh, same with, uh, there are a whole bunch of apocalypses. Um, the Apocalypse of Peter, the Apocalypse of Thomas, the first, uh, Thomas, the first Apocalypse of James, the second Apocalypse of James, and there's all sorts of other ones on here. At this point, I got very bored listing all of these random things that I, quite frankly, never spent any time thinking or worrying about because the church knows about it. From early times, um, one of the early uh, leaders in the, uh, the church is a guy by the name of Origen, writing in kind of mid 300s. And he says, you know, I, I was curious about all this, so I read everything I could get my hands on. Um, something that claimed to be authoritative, claimed to talk about Jesus, and most of it's garbage. What's worth reading, he says? The 66 books we know in our, our Bibles. He, he almost uh, explicitly lays out, this is, this is it. Um, and he's got some back and forth, and we'll take a look at some of those as we go on here, but... Um, by and large, the church knows about this stuff. This is not a secret. It's not something we're trying to hide from you. The reason we have the Bible is because we believe this is what God gave us. And it's not a new belief that we in the 21st century, all of a sudden, we believe something that the church nowhere else in all of human history is believing. No, uh, from the earliest days that we have records, they're holding to the books that we hold to. And yes, there's a question about some of them. Some of those Angela Gomino books are you know, kind of waffle on that a little bit. The early church kind of waffles back and forth a little bit about the Apocrypha too. Um, they, they kind of go back and forth on that. But by and large, what we have is what we have. What we have is what we've always had. Because God has given us His Word. And as much as there is some question about a few things, it is very clear God has given us His Word in its fullest completeness. Part of the reason there's a question about, say, the Apocrypha is that next category there, the Septuagint. A major Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, and it includes several apocryphal books. Most of that's the Apocrypha that uh, uh, the Roman Catholic Church holds to. Um, 
some of these extra books of uh, additions to Daniel and Esther and Tobit and Judith and all that. Um, so as uh, about 250 years before Jesus, they start this translation, translating the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek. You've got a different set of books. The question is, where do those extra books come from? For, uh, again, most if not all of them, they're not in Hebrew. Uh, Jerome is one that translates uh, the next one, the Vulgate. Uh, he translates from the Greek and Hebrew into Latin, and that becomes the official translation of the Catholic Church. Um, he says, as he's translating, that I've not found all of these apocryphal books in Hebrew. There's one that I think has a Hebrew style to the Greek, but otherwise, uh, it's actually all Greek and it's not Hebrew. So, uh, there's a little bit of a discrepancy then. Um, are we following the Hebrew scriptures or the Greek scriptures in the Old Testament? Are we following those extra books that are added in the Greek translation of the Old Testament? Or are we sticking with the Hebrew canon? And that's one question that really does uh, send us on different, uh, different paths moving forward. Uh, as Jerome translates the Vulgate, um, it's used mostly in the western part of the church, so that's the uh, Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant churches today, and it includes apocryphal books um, of both definitions that I have above, uh, writings that are good for personal use, not to be read publicly, or writings with questionable authorship and or content, therefore rejected. So Jerome includes all this stuff because he says churches are using this, it, it's Greek, not Hebrew, some of it's worth reading, some of it's not. But I have it, I'm sharing it with you. Come the Council of Trent, they specifically define their scriptures as the 72 books of the Bible, not just 66, but it's 72, specifically from the old Latin Vulgate edition. Not the Greek manuscripts. Not any, any other things, uh, not trying to understand it in a different way, but specifically the Vulgate. Uh, and so, they hitched their wagon onto one translation of the Bible that uh, we recognize is good and helpful at the time, but it includes some, some translation choices that are questionable at best, and it includes some books that are questionable at best. And so we really do wrestle with that a little bit as we're trying to understand all right, how do we have the Bible that we have and how do we balance what we have versus um, where other churches have, have come to different conclusions. Does that make enough sense, at least for now? All right. I, I do have a big old stack of... Um, of Quotations from early church fathers uh, that I think not even we won't have time to even pass them out. We will look at next week Jerome, Eusebius, Augustine, and then some of the Catholic and Lutheran sources later on in history, um, and trying to, to see how we got the Bible that we have, seeing some of that firsthand testimony from those uh, that were there in the beginning. Uh, but. Uh, for now, I, we still do have a few minutes. Are there any thoughts or questions before we wrap up for the day? Are some of the text music as the book of Yeah, I'm not sure in our Kindle. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I know in the Anglican Church um, that one of the One of the apocryphal books is like the traditional writing text. Uh, if I'm remembering right, um, and again, I'm not as familiar with that. Uh, historically, the church has used these books. It's just uh, so uh, the question is, how can we use them? How can we read them and understand them in a way that's helpful, but not on the same level as the Bible? One, uh, one of the comparisons I heard, it, I'm not so sure I'm on the same page as this, but they said some of these apocryphal books, good but not canon. They say essentially that the Christian church is a Protestant church, they have some of these apocryphal books that we say are good, but not on the same level as Scripture. Let's say 
near Christianity, but I see it as We consider that good. Most Christians should read that. We benefit from reading that. Is it the Bible? No. Um, we might throw in Luther's small catechism in this category. Good. Is it scripture? No. Um, and so we do kind of recognize there are places and, and there are times for us to read things apart from what we know as the Bible. Uh, so the question is, what officially gets included in that? All right. I'm not seeing any other uh, thoughts or questions here. So we will wrap up today uh, a few minutes early, but uh, we've got plenty to go through next time. we we'll just keep plowing our way through this. Let's go to the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.